1984, the computer scientist Aaron Sloman published a paper arguing that we need more systematic thinking about minds. And he said it was time to admit into that conversation what we had learned about animal cognition, um, as well as what research on AI and computer science had told us. He said, clearly, there's not just one sort of mind. Besides obvious differences between adults, there are differences between adults, children of various ages, and infants. There are cross-cultural differences. There are also differences between humans, chimpanzees, dogs, mice, and other animals. And there are differences between all those and machines. Um, and his paper was entitled, The Structure of the Space of Possible Minds. And he was arguing that minds exist not just along a, a line that measures something like intelligence, but in a rich, multi-dimensional space. And this blending of computer science and behaviorism must have seemed a bit eccentric in the 1980s, but today it looks astonishingly prescient. Although this cartography of the space of possible minds has barely begun, it, this is a really good time to start thinking about what it might look like. Not only has AI at last started to prove its value, but there's a perception that making further improvements to AI and getting anything like artificial, like general AI, um, human-like AI, will require a close consideration of how today's putative machine minds actually function and how they differ from our own. And our understanding of animal cognition, too, has got much richer in the past decade uh, or two in part because of the possibilities that neuroscience and information technologies have opened up. And so today we can find child psychologists talking to roboticists and computer engineers and neurologists talking to marine biologists. We have some of the conceptual tools and some of the experimental tools to start mapping out this landscape of minds. Um, I, I guess I need to start by asking that difficult question, what is a mind? And the, uh, I, we have to admit there is no scientific definition that's going to help us here. Most of the vast literature that exists on the philosophy of mind just takes it for granted that we're talking about us. Okay. Um, the philosopher Daniel Dennett, um, he uh, started thinking in this way in his uh, 1996 book, Kinds of Mind. And he said that whatever else a mind is, it is supposed to be something like our minds. Otherwise, we wouldn't call it a mind. So mind is one of those concepts like, like intelligence, like thought, like life, um, that sounds kind of technical, but it's actually a bit fuzzy and, and colloquial. Now, I propose to talk about it in a similar way to the way John Searle, the philosopher of mind, talked about consciousness. Um, so I'm saying that for an entity to have a mind, there must be something it is like to be that entity. So I don't believe that you know, this glass has a mind. I don't think it has an experience. I don't think that uh, asking what it's like to be this glass means anything at all. On the other hand, I reckon that most people are probably ready to accept that, say, an orangutan has a mind. You might consider there's something it is like to be a mouse, perhaps even a fly, maybe a fungus. Uh, maybe that's pushing it a bit too far, although we'll return to that question uh, in a bit. Um, and I think it makes sense to speak there, not in terms of things that absolutely do or don't have a mind, but of mindedness, to, to, to acknowledge that it's not an all or nothing attribute. It's a matter of degree. And one of the benefits of thinking about a space of possible minds is that we can think about those matters of degree in many attributes, many different dimensions, coordinates of that space. And let me illustrate um, what this might mean by just uh, telling you about a couple of efforts to say what mind space might look like previously. So a simple and ingenious way to start drawing this map was devised by some American psychologists, Daniel Wegner, Kurt Gray, and Heather Gray in 2007. And they, asked, they simply asked people what people thought about what minds were like. Minds not just of humans, but also of things like robots and companies and supernatural agents, ghosts and God. Um, what attributes do we think they have? Surprisingly, the responses they got could be boiled down to a space of possible minds that had just two key attributes labeled, that they labeled experience and agency. And here, experience means how much inner life 
the entity has. So a capacity for things like fear and pain and hunger and pleasure and joy. The agency, meanwhile, refers to the ability to do things, to accomplish goals, to possess memory, to plan and communicate. So really, this was a space of possible perceived minds, what we humans imagine that space might look like. And it could be, because it just had these two dimensions, you could plot it as a sort of uh, two-dimensional graph on which every kind of mind could be a, a single data point on that graph. And it was striking that one of the things that came out of this was that people think that there isn't just a place where human minds go, that we actually have a trajectory that we follow through life. So babies were in one place. They were actually rated by people as having a higher experience than an adult mind, but much lower agency. So, you know, for a baby, everything is intensely felt, but they don't get much done. Um, and so we follow that trajectory, you know, as children, and then we get to the human mind. And interestingly, even when we die, people perceive that we don't leave the map. There's a space on that map where people think dead people are. Um, and an, another attempt to plot out a space of minds has been made by the neuroscientist Christoph Koch. His mind space is also two-dimensional, and he gives it coordinates of intelligence and consciousness. So we have both, and in terms of uh, thinking about a animals, it's actually quite a simple plot. It's just a kind of diagonal line where we're sort of up here at the top with the most amount of intelligence and consciousness, and then other animals, you know, dogs and cats, and then you get all the way down to jellyfish sort of down here are on there. But Christoph also thought we can put other things in this space. We can put, for example, um, AI and, and computers, which uh, in his view have intelligence, but don't have really any significant consciousness at all. And he feels that actually that's not likely to change anytime soon, perhaps never. Now, in both of these uh, mind spaces, we are sort of up there in the top right corner. So we have the maximum amount of these attributes. And we're really assessing all other minds relative to us and how they, you know, comparing them to how they, how they compare with us. Well, that's just the way we are, right? We're ego e egotists. But perhaps that's inevitable. As Dennett says, it's hard to even think about what minds might mean unless it's in reference to our own. So let's start thinking about our own minds. The philosopher Ned Block um, also suggested there are two attributes of human minds, but his were intelligence, which he, by which he meant an information processing capacity that turns a stimulus into a behavior, and intentionality. And intentionality uh, supplies the purpose and the motive for that behavior by somehow relating it to the world around us. Dennett argues that to have intentions means that the mind must be a generator of expectations and predictions. You know, what else is an intention but a, a hope, a wish for certain outcomes in the future, certain outcomes that we consider to be at least possible. Dennett says that the mind minds the present for clues, which it refines with the help of materials it has saved from the past, turning them into anticipations of the future. And then it acts rationally on the basis of those hard-won anticipations. And this view of the human mind as a predictor, I think, suggests how it differs from a machine-like stimulus response system. Because not only are our decisions and predictions often, as you might have noticed, rather poor for actually obtaining our goals, but most of the time, we're not even sure what the goal really is. Or rather, we might have many conflicting goals and not the slightest idea of how to calculate a route between them. And I'd suggest that our minds, as well as those of other animals, are not stimulus response circuits, machine-like uh, systems for creating actions, but they're actually the alternative to that sort of automaton-like behavior. <laughs> so the simplest organisms, like bacteria, um, are, they often show behavior that is, is hardwired. They have a very limited repertoire of actions uh, that are generated reliably and predictably by certain stimuli from the environment. Now, even that is simplifying it for bacteria. They're more complex than that. But you can see that that's the kind of behavior they tend to have. Our minds exist, I think, to free us from that, to free us, if you like, from our genetic hardwiring by allowing us actions that aren't pre-programmed. The amazing thing about humans is not that our genes affect the way we think and the choices we make, they undoubtedly do, but how much of our behavior seems to escape 
their dominating influence. Complex minds have a vast repertoire uh, of behaviors that can be fine-tuned and adjusted and actually improvised to the circumstances. And actually, this makes evolutionary sense, because if evolution wants to give a creature, to put it very anthropomorphically, wants to give a creature lots of behavioral options for surviving in a complex environment, then it can either invest a lot in hardwiring a response to every foreseeable circumstance, or, and this seems a much more efficient way to do things, or it can build that creature a mind. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.